Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast for which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew Fox from TheEthicalPanda.com. And I'm Andy Nelson from the Next Real Film Podcast. And today we're talking about Minute 85, which begins with more flying but not cutting glass and ends with Sif's shield clattering to the ground. We also will have a um, deleted scene to talk about where glass actually does have some bad effects. Joining us on the show today, we have Robin Burge from Karate Kid Minute and Travis Bowe from Real Comic Heroes, Marvel Events Timeline, and The Watchmen Minute. It's been so great having you all in this minute. I don't want you to like speak something to existence you're not ready for, but for each of you, it, what's the one thing that you haven't yet either seen or been a part of a by minute yourself that in the back of your mind, you're like, one day, that's the one I'm going to do? Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of talk about this and it would only be for the first movie. I would not take on the franchise, but, uh, I'm really wanting to do Highlander minute like badly. (laughs) I want you to do Highlander minute too. No, no. I mean, you can't do more. (laughs) Not, not to the sequel. I meant (laughs) as well. I want you to do that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was gonna say, uh, you, you could do the best sequel, which is the one that came out on Netflix, uh, like six months ago. Um, oh. whose name I'm now totally, it, it's not an actual <laughs> Highlander, uh, thing. It's, it's just the exact same story. Oh, with the Charlize? With, um, uh, I think of the, the old guard. guard. Yeah, Charlize yes. the old guard. Thank you. Yeah. It, I think it's the best Highlander sequel out there. Yeah. There can be only <laughs> one movie to talk about though, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. Travis, what about yourself? Um, so, <laughs> After Watchmen, I made plans to do uh, the Iron Giants and oh, uh, did some pre-production stuff. I, I made artwork for it. I you know split up the movie, got everything ready to go, and then quarantine happened, and we had plenty of time, and I didn't use a single bit of it <laughs> to do any work on that show. And so it just kind of withered away. Um, I may eventually do it someday, but I don't know. Um, so there's that I could do. Um, I've also thought about doing a slap shot minute, mm. but uh, oh. just just as a fun, you know, kind of kind of movie to take a look at. But yeah, I don't know. Cool. Well, we'll get to hear more of your thoughts on Thor in just one moment. We love doing this show and talking all things Marvel Cinematic Universe, Thor, really just everything. It's just there's so much juicy stuff to talk about, but it does take time and cost money. If you'd love to support us in the work that we do, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. Please consider becoming a patron of our show. You might be familiar with Patreon, but you might not be familiar with Memberful, which is Patreon's other platform. That allows you to build your support right into your own site. That's what we use. So if you've been thinking of becoming a patron to show your love for the show, but you weren't sure because you couldn't find us on Patreon, just know we are, in fact, using their platform. Just visit truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute, and you can find out what we offer to our patrons. It's only $5 a month, or you can get a discount if you join at the annual rate. Thanks. What kind of leapt out at you about either this minute or just this whole five minute stretch we've been talking about? We do get more close ups of Thor, and I'm sure this has been talked to uh, to death. But the eyebrows, and also, does he have like black contact lenses on? This or is or am I just? Is it the lighting? His eyes look very yeah. dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through through this whole scene, I, I put it in the notes somewhere for this week, but I I. I can't remember where but it was one of those things where i'm like do his eyes seem like darker like they purposefully like darkened his eyes for this like i don't know what's going on with him but yeah he looks like something's changed in his eyes <laughs> is he possessed yeah. I, like i don't understand <laughs> yeah it's it's so weird and I, i'm glad that someone else noticed it there was- there are some moments in in this movie that this chris hemsworth looks nothing like he does you know Oh, okay. Throughout the rest of the like, his nose is it bigger here? Is it wider? I, it just he his face changed so much, and it's not just the you know the the bleaching or or mm-hmm. whatever they did with the the hair and the eyebrows and the beard and stuff. It's his face structure just looks so much different. And I think I think he's a little he's got a little bit more weight in his face in this yeah. movie. Um, 
where he's leaned down quite a bit for the for the you know yeah for everything after this I think but it is weird. I mean, maybe he had that Mark Hamill motorcycle moment, you know, where like <laughs> facial reconstructed surgery, which kept all quiet. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Uh, so in this minute, so we're we're still in the fight scene. Um, we get some great shots of of Sif and the Destroyer, and, and then we see that Hogan is in the diner, and like I was already thinking that Volstag was 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 dead. Hogan is just like it, it sucked apparently, but he's pretty much okay. Hogan. I, Sorry. How, <laughs> how do you kill an Asgardian? Like, are they just, are they kind of, I know they were immortal in terms of like, they live forever or like compared to humans, but like, th- they take an awful lot of killing, it would seem so far. That actually reminds me of of a point that you guys have, have talked about on the show pretty early on um, about Thor in general. Like, it, 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 is he super powered when he's, you know, obviously his powers have been taken away. And something that I kind of wanted to, to bring up once once uh, I was on the show was the fact that he, Thor. Like, okay, let me think about it. Um, Thor doesn't have his power, but he still has the strength of an Asgardian, which is greater than you know humans, um, and and even for an Asgardian, he is much stronger than. You know, your your typical Volstag and and a Hogan, and um, so I think that's part of why he is much stronger in this movie. You know, when he's just in in mortal form, but um, but yeah, I mean, I don't. As far as like how you you would kill an Asgardian, I think you just uh, cut off the head and start start from there. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be, well, you know they they eat their golden apples. I don't know what are you going to do. Yeah. They, they're very, they're very tough, uh, and and I mean, we don't even see Fandral, who also when he does come out, he's totally fine. So somewhere inside Isabella's, like Fandral and uh, Hogan, found the perfect place to hide. Like I, I don't know how they didn't get blasted out of the building in flames, like Volstag. They did. they jumped in the fridge, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and so then we get Thor running over to Sif, uh, and the hero passage where I think his eyes look really weird. And we get this great exchange between the two of them where, like, you know, he's saying she should go, and, and she's not even saying, like, don't worry, I can win. She's saying, like, I, I will die a warrior's death. They'll sing great songs about it. And he says, why don't you live a life so you can sing the songs yourself? I, I love this scene, and I, I'm kind of curious, you know, what, what do you think of this exchange the two of them have, and what does it mean for where Thor's character is going? I really feel like uh, it, it, it should have taken longer, but I realize that it's a movie and we got to move things along. But I feel like a like Sif gives up way too easy. She's like, all right, <laughs> I guess I'll listen to it. I, I feel like she's got a little <laughs> bit more fight in her, you know? She gave it her best and, and it didn't work. And I think she's like, yeah, as an as guardian, she wants to, you know, go down swinging, you know, be allowed into Valhalla, you know, welcome – in you know, um, but yeah, I, I like that. That once Thor says, you know, no, you know, you've tried, like, you know, live, live. You know that I, I do love that message too of, of Thor giving her just yeah, don't don't die because it's it's you should you know that's that's just foolish. Well, and it's such a difference for him. I yeah. I don't remember if he actually says it, but it feels like something he very much would say where like someone's like, but you might die. It's like, you know, it's a kind of Klingon. Like then today will be a good day to die. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and to me, there's two things happening here. One is that Thor has, has accepted that that's kind of dumb. But the other is that he's he he doesn't want he, he doesn't think he's going to go back. He knows that if they all leave, the destroyer is probably going to kill him. He's basically saying, like, I don't now that the townspeople are safe. You don't need to stay and lo- risk your lives from me, and it's just it's just all the self sacrifice that we've never seen from him before. Yeah, that's that's what I love about it. I mean, I, yeah, I I I, I, uh, I struggle with you know that big explosion from the last minute that the destroyer somehow landed right between the warriors three and Sif that seems to have knocked all of the fight out of all of them. <laughs> like I, that, I do struggle with that a little bit. But yeah, I mean, we're hitting that point in the film where we just need to move things along. We got to take them out so Thor can have his moment. And so to that end, I do think that it ends up working. It's just I, it, the construction is a little sloppy, a little, a little, you know, too speedy for me. Yeah. But I, I, I see where they're going, and I, I'm okay with it. I, I think we're supposed to think it's more about 
Sif having basically delivered what should have been a killing blow and it not mattering. Yeah. And then now feeling, but I think you're right because, because it happens only after the blasts that have happened after that, like the, the connection between those two things is kind of lost. Right. Yeah, exactly. If he told Sif, like I would, I would understand it more if she would give up, if he was, if he said the same thing he said to the Warriors three, which is like, you got to get back to Asgard and stop Loki. And, you know, maybe perhaps, a little additional, like if you stop Loki, then the destroyer will stop. Because I'm going to go, and I'm probably going to sacrifice myself. But he, it, I mean, its orders are to destroy, so it's not like it's going to stop with him. So I don't know. Maybe the the they decided not to make it that transparent <laughs> about what's going on here. Well, and it's interesting because in the script, I mean, I like that he has the message for them to go back and and you know. You need to you need to kind of keep the fight going in the script. It's just like, you know, Fandral's like we can still fight. And Thor's like, you know, but not win. Move Volstag or he'll die. And so, I mean, I mean, it is very much concern for his friend in that particular moment, which we didn't see back on on Jotunheim. But at the same time, it's like um, I I, I like that there's a little more kind of uh, motivation this particular moment here. Yeah. Well, and then we get another right after that is, um, you know, they start to leave. And and here's where I think we get a very revealing moment for about Thor. I'm curious if you all see it the same way, because he says, like, don't worry, my friends, I have a plan. And the smirk he has on his face is exactly the smirk we saw, you know, back when he was leading them into Jotunheim. Hmm. And then the camera captures that once they sort of listen and start to turn away, the smirk falls from his face. and. You know, we get that scene where he has the the shield and he just looks kind of hopeless and drops the shield and suddenly plastic makes the sound of metal. <laughs> um, but th- the sense that I got was that this is all bluster. He mm-hmm. knows he's probably going to die. He doesn't have a plan, but he doesn't want them to die for him. So he's trying to fake that he that he has it under control so that they'll feel okay going back. It, it, is, is that am I reading too much into that or do you get that kind of sense as well? Oh, no, I totally understand that. You're you're exactly right. That's that's Thor is is inspiring them, telling them everything's going to be okay because I've got I've got a plan, guys. It's all going to be just fine. When he knows that that he doesn't have a plan, you know, it's it's not mm-hmm. unless unless he's wondering if in the back of his mind, am I worthy now? Mm. Uh, that could be his plan if he has a plan. I I, I think ultimately, I think. His plan is, sac- uh, um, sorry, distract so that his friends can get out of there. Yeah, because I, I, I think that, I mean, if anything, the fact that he sees the destroyer here, I would assume, well, he sees the destroyer. He also knows that Loki lied to him about his father being dead. So, I mean, he pretty much knows, we saw last week, that look of his face like oh loki's this is all planned loki's put into place and i think in this moment my assumption is that he sees the destroyer here and he is like the destroyer is here for me and so yeah i i think it it really is that whole thing of like get everybody away give my ch- friends a chance to get away both my mid guardian friends and my as guardian friends a chance to get away i'll try to take the destroyer on and hopefully defeat it but at least they can get away, even if I fail. And and so I, I think that it's less him thinking about, like, am I worthy and more? And this is why it's so important, because it really is what makes him worthy. The fact that he isn't thinking about himself, he's thinking about how can I save all of these people? What's the best way to do that? And it's cre- to create this distraction to hopefully stop this thing that Loki sent just for him. Yeah. And <laughs> You know, just to talk a little bit about the the acting also, like we were talking about how Hemsworth is a little bit unrecognizable at moments, you know, uh, but <laughs> I feel like this is a great Chris, Chris Hemsworth moment. This is a this is a great moment for him oh, yeah. that we're going to see him, you know, explore more in later uh, movies. I think uh, this this, you know, this bluster, but then there's there's some emotion behind there. You know, there's uh, I'm not looking forward to this, but, you know, it's what I have to do. 
And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated that. Yeah. I also like his, uh, his ventriloquist bit that he did a moment ago where his mouth was not saying the words that he was saying to the Warriors three. <laughs> Definitely. But yeah, <laughs> gotta, gotta love those moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I wonder in, in the what if of verse, could the Warriors three and Sif defeat Loki? Like, if they could get back to Asgard, you know, which I don't even know if they could. I mean, as far as I know, Heimdall isn't, you know, around to, to grant them access. But if they could get back to Asgard, I wonder what that would look like. Hmm. That's a good question, because they they don't know anything about the Jotun blood, the fact that he is a Jotun. Right. Like, they... right. They would think that they're just fighting the Loki that they've known. Uh, yeah. So. Like, I think it'd be very interesting because I think it would be that classic, like, you know, brains against brawn where, like, if they actually stand toe to toe on a field of battle, Loki's going to get his butt kicked. But Loki's too smart to ever let that happen. You know, it's just mostly just like, can they avoid trap after trap after, you know, deception after deception to ever actually like corner him and, and hit him with a sword? I think there's to be a line of frozen statues on the on the bridge, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, certainly possible. <laughs> certainly possible. Very alarmed looking statues. <laughs> I would yeah. love to see that. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and then we get this great scene of the shield fall. Like, like, I've been making fun of the noise it makes. But putting that aside, I think it's very effective. I mean, I think it's such a, like, because Sif has kind of given him, like, a one piece of Asgard, and he just drops it. You see clatter the ground. And to me, that that's such the, like, this is a man without hope right now. Yeah. It's a man without hope, but it's also a man who, like, I, I feel like, I don't know, I guess I, I, I read it as something like, this is a man who feels like, you know, he needs to go mano a mano with this thing. Mm. That's fair. Yeah, he knows the shield isn't going to isn't gonna make any difference, so. Yeah. Plastic melts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he needs to look like a weaker target, I think. Because he wants the destroyer to come specifically after him, so mm, you yeah, take fair. away all armor, you know, just just it needs to just be him. Yeah, right, right. I just I I have to say before we uh, uh, start wrapping this up, um, you you talked about this yesterday, uh, Matthew Volstag's body hurling from the building in flames mm. uh you know from the moment he's landed on the bench here like there's nothing that shows <laughs> any sign that he had been on fire yeah. at all his hair is perfectly intact i mean he looks beaten down but i mean you know there's nothing no charring yeah. or anything that's I, a moment that i feel like yeah they could have done something a little more there I mean, this is true of the entire MCU, is that the words blunt force trauma, particularly from falling, like falling damage does not exist in the MCU yeah. in any way. There are numerous times where humans even, like not superpowered people, fall like 50 feet out of a building or out of a plane and are just like, mm, that that hurt. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I thought Volsegg was dead, especially like the way he crashes against the wall. He falls down out of the chair. Yeah, but he's fine. <laughs> he's fine. fine. As guardians are made of rubber. Just a scratch. Yeah. Uh, any other last things about the scene itself, or should we start talking about the uh, deleted scene? My only other note on this one was in the realm of, of bad effects. When the destroyer is down the street and you see Sif and Thor behind the car and the destroyer like blasts the ground between us and them, like, <laughs> like right up the middle of the road, that is just like some of just really bad effects. It's, it's you know... 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. It definitely looks like little explosives are just going off. Yeah. Yeah. It just, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't quite work. So let's talk about this deleted scene for a second. And, um, uh, just because I, uh, I think we've done this before, we, we forgot it last time, but, um, you know, some of our listeners might be watching the movie along with us, but may not have access to the deleted scenes and stuff like that. Someone wanted to give a quick summary of what we get in this deleted scene. It's largely a, uh, a moment with uh, specifically Eric, this is a we, we when we saw in the last minute when uh, you know uh, the the scientists three, as we were calling them, get pelted with with glass uh, before th or when Thor runs back to see them, or he specifically runs away from them because, as it turns out, glass does actually uh, impale uh, Eric's chest, mm -hmm. and so 
Um, he's lying there dying, and and Hogan had brought his bag of healing stones or his pouch of healing stones, whatever it is. Thor runs down the street to find it, picks it up, brings it back, finds a healing stone, crushes it over Eric and uh, the glass, the wound, and the hole in the shirt all are magically healed uh, by <laughs> Thor. So that's that's pretty much the deleted scene here. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's mostly kind of a moment about Thor, but I, I just need to quote one thing that Eric says because it was such a brilliant moment and fights against a trope that I kind of hate. You know, how many times have we seen the hero say, like, or any of the characters be like, oh, you go ahead. Don't try to save me. I'm dying. <laughs> and and Eric calls that out very specifically. He says, I'm probably supposed to say, don't go ahead without me, but I really don't want yeah. to. Yeah. Like, yeah. I just... <laughs> I don't know if we needed this scene, but I wanted that moment because it's so good. I love it as he gets that that out. It kind of causes him to laugh and that causes him great pain. You know, just yeah. to look, look. He just acts it like you can feel that he is in pain. Like it's just yeah. that's good acting. Uh, one thing was Hogan's he healing stone introduced earlier in the movie that I missed this. No, it was in a, it was in another deleted scene. They've all oh. been cut out of the deleted scenes. Yeah. But yeah, you see when. Odin, when they return from Jotunheim, and Odin says, get him to the healing room, you see that Hogan is actually applying some some healing stone magic to Volstagg's arm to heal the uh, necrotization that had happened after the Frost Giant touched him. Ah. So it, it is a thing that had been introduced, and that's probably why they cut this in addition to trying to speed things up. But yeah. yeah. Right. I feel like it had to be cut because there's some great moments in it, but the, the healing stone thing is kind of unnecessary. But also... This only makes sense if, like, the bell at the end of round three has been wrong and the destroyer is back in its <laughs> yeah. corner. Because they're just sitting there in the street for two minutes. The very noise of the destroyer, like, get, making sure that Isabella's diner is really, really dead. <laughs> um, and I think that to me, that, that that's, if I think if I'd seen it in the middle of the movie, I, I, I wouldn't have had as powerful an effect because I'd just be like, they're, they're sitting ducks. The destroyer's just wiping yeah. them out. Also, like, Thor exactly. is, like, running back and forth. Around the, and, yeah. and especially he runs by Sif. He's like, stay there. <laughs> I'll be back to you. <laughs> I think one reason it, I, I like this deleted scene, but I think it needs to go because it ruins the reveal that he is an Asgardian god. I mean, of course, we already know that. And up until now, Jane... And and Darcy and Eric have really only seen him as a man. And right. for him to kind of do this magic in front of them, like there's a, a look between Jane and Darcy of like, I is this really happening? You know, is this magic? And think about like, I think it's going to happen next week when I, I love the reveal when when Thor returns and you get the, you know, Jane saying, oh, my God, uh, I love that that, you know, moment. I think that's when, you know, she needs to realize he's not a crazy homeless man. He is, you know, a, a Norse god. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 I had the same look uh, when I was when he was holding his hand over Eric's chest and like there seemed to be some sort of like energy coming off. I was like, I had the same look as Jane <laughs> and Darcy. Like, what? what is this power? What is this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a frustrating element that i'm glad that they did cut because yeah i mean you want that reveal because I, I mean honestly the warriors three and sif we've talked about it, they look like they're from a ren fair right <laughs> yeah. like they, they came to town like have they done anything i mean sure they're doing yeah. some they have some great moves and sifs you jump off the roof is pretty fantastic but in the scope of things they're not doing anything like you know throwing hammers through the sky that that return to you like a boomerang or anything like that and so it it seems like sure they're tough but they I mean, you could almost buy – they're just really strong people. <laughs> they threw the big guy. <laughs> well, they just threw the big guy. Well, and, and he's got like high levels of soak damage, clearly. But yeah, that, I mean, Andy, you and I talked about this last week, that there is that scene where, you know, Selvig is saying like, well, we need proof. And then the Warriors 3 and Sif show up. And, and the and and Eric and Darcy and Jane are all asking, acting like, is this is this proof? Right. And, and yeah. my thought, like like I talked about last week, was this just proves he's got Renfair friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I noticed. The, I thought I had that same thought when I was just watching the movie. Yeah, that that really doesn't prove anything. Yeah, yeah, right. So. So. 
Well, anyway, this has been fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I think like, that brings us to the end of the minute. Um, uh, for both of you, though, has, uh, and, and for Andy, is there anything about this minute in particular or any of these minutes that we haven't gotten a chance to get into? There's, there's this one moment in both the deleted scene and the minute itself where I swear Sif is holding a pad of paper. Like she's holding her script asides <laughs> or something. Uh, it, it, it's during a close up, and I mm. wish I could narrow down exactly which second. But watch her when she's sitting behind the vehicle, and when uh, Thor oh. walks by. I I swear she's holding something. Maybe it's a weapon, but it looks like a pad of paper. I, <laughs> it's in one of the wide shots when he runs past her. Or? No, no. When she, it's close up, you see the bottom. Uh, you see like the, the top of the pad of paper or something. It's I think it's her shield. Paper. Is it a shield? And it could be the arm, um, the what do you call it? The arm armor, like the the because yeah. her the the pieces of her armor that cover her the bracers, mm. bracers. Yeah, they're very white uh, sometimes, and so mm-hmm, yeah, uh, I think that could be it. Just guessing, yeah, maybe. Mm. Every time I want to back yeah, up yeah, this yeah, video, ask me ask me if I want to add a note, so I can't I can't find it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same thing, same thing. Travis, Robin, thank you so much. It's been great having you on the show this week. Um, really hoping you get to come back for for later seasons and stuff like that. Although Thor: The Dark World, I will not be having any part of. So um, uh, have fun if you uh, wander into that piece of cinematic genius. Um, I would gladly <laughs> talk about Thor: The Dark Thor. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Uh, Chris Eccleston, the the wasted actor. Oh, um, poor Chris. But uh, just just one more. Uh, yeah, to me, it's, yeah. it's just such a good actor. It, to me, one more time um, for our fans, you know, uh, if, if they're going to find your stuff, where should they look? Uh, for me, check out uh, Marvel Events Timeline. It's a, it's a fairly new podcast. We've got a couple of episodes out and we're talking about the, you know, we're going back to the start of, with uh, Timely Comics and we've got episodes about uh, Namor and the Human Torch. And then we've got some episodes that are just about uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. And, and then we'll have episodes about you know, when artists go to war and talking about these comic book creators that go fight in World War Two and then come back and and kind of what that's going to be like. And so we're, it's going to be about events in the comic book universe, but it's also going to be about the creators and and things like that. So uh, we'll eventually get to big events, you know, in, in the 60s and the 70s and 80s and Secret War and, and all that kind of stuff. But. We're uh, we're taking it slow and and starting at the very beginning. So sounds great, Rob. What about yourself? Uh, I would say check out Karate Kid Minute. Uh, we have uh, we go through the movies minute by minute or two minutes by two minutes. Um, and if you're just a Cobra Kai fan, we're going to be coming back uh, for Cobra Kai season four. And a great thing I wouldn't want you to miss out on is an interview that I did with uh, Bob Dearden, one of the writers of uh, uh, last season of uh, Cobra Kai. He kind of breaks down the writing of uh, the epic uh, couple of uh, episodes he he wrote for that season, including the season finale. So uh, check it out. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Definitely want to check it out. I, I, I am also super excited for the coming of uh, season four of Cobra Kai. So I'll look forward to both that and, and getting to hear your podcast. Well, thank you both. It's been wonderful getting to talk to you uh, all this week. Andy, thank you as always to our fans. Thank you. You make this all possible. And have a good day. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. Music